So 15 years ago, I came across a video. And this video was of this cute little object. It was a metal object. And it was a robot. It had these big blue eyes, bushy brows, red Play-Doh looking lips, weird kind of animal looking ears. And the cutest thing happened. In the video, it was saying, I love you. you. He said he loves me. And my heart melted. I felt it loved me. But it's a robot. And robots can't love. And that's what's going to always separate us from technology. Technology doesn't care about us. So as more jobs are going to be done by robots, AI, automation, how does this lack of human touch separate the work that humans should do from the work machines should do? I'm Madhu Bakanola, and this is TED Business. And today, we're going to hear from Kai Fu Lee. He's a leader of a venture capital firm in China that invests in the latest technology. He's also the author of a book called AI Superpowers. And in this talk, he's going to share an unusual idea, that AI might just free us up to be more human. So let's hear from Kai Fu after a quick break. There's a new podcast from the TED Audio Collective that you might enjoy called Body Stuff with Dr. Jen Gunter. Body Stuff debunks the myths we've been told and sold about our health by exploring how the body works and some of the surprising backstories behind so-called cures. Is it actually possible to boost the immune system? Do we really need eight glasses of water a day? Find out and follow Body Stuff with Dr. Jen Gunter wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm going to talk about how AI and mankind can coexist. But first, we have to rethink about our human values. So let me first make a confession about my errors in my values. It was 11 o'clock, December 16, 1991. I was about to become a father for the first time. My wife, Shenling, lay in the hospital bed, going through a very difficult 12-hour labor. I sat by her bedside but looked anxiously at my watch. And I knew something that she didn't. I knew that if in one hour our child didn't come, I was going to leave her there and go back to work and make a presentation about AI to my boss, Apple CEO. Fortunately, (laughs) my daughter was born at 11.30. sparing me from doing the unthinkable. And to this date, I am so sorry for letting my work ethic take precedence over love for my family. My AI talk, however, went off brilliantly. (laughs) Apple loved my work and decided to announce it at TED 1992. 26 years ago, on this very stage, I thought I had made one of the biggest, most important discoveries in AI, and so did the Wall Street Journal on the following day. But as far as discoveries went, uh, it turned out I didn't discover India or America. Perhaps I discovered a little island off of Portugal. But the AI era of discovery continued, and more scientists pour their souls into it. About 10 years ago, the grand AI discovery was made by three North American scientists, and it's known as deep learning. Deep learning is a technology that can take a huge amount of data within one single domain and learn to predict or decide at superhuman accuracy. For example, if we show the deep learning network a massive number of food photos, it can recognize food. Or if we show that many pictures and videos and sensor data from uh, driving on the highway, it can actually drive a car as well as a human being on the highway. So deep learning has become the core in the era of AI discovery, and that's led by the U.S. But we're now in the era of implementation, where what really matters is execution, product quality, speed, and data. And that's where China comes in. Uh, Chinese entrepreneurs 
whom I fund as a venture capitalist, are incredible workers, amazing work ethic.、Uh, my example in the delivery room is nothing compared to how hard people work in China. As an example, one startup tried to claim work-life balance. Come work for us because we are nine nine six. And what does that mean? It means the work hours of 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. six days a week. That's contrasted with other startups that do 997. And the Chinese product quality has consistently gone up in the past decade, and that's because of a fiercely competitive environment. In Silicon Valley, entrepreneurs compete very gentlemanly in a very gentlemanly fashion, sort of like in old wars, which. In which each side took turn to fire at each other, <laughs> but in the Chinese environment, it's truly a gladiatorial fight to the death. In such a brutal environment, entrepreneurs learn to grow very rapidly. They learn to, to make their products better at lightning speed, and they learn to hone their business models until they are impregnable. As a result, great Chinese products like WeChat and Weibo are arguably better. Than the equivalent American products from Facebook and Twitter. So, as a result, the Chinese AI companies have leaped ahead, so that today the most valuable companies in computer vision, speech recognition, speech synthesis, machine translation, and drones are all Chinese companies. So, with U.S. leading the era of discovery and China leading the era of implementation. We're now in an amazing age, where the dual engine of the two superpowers are working together to drive the fastest revolution in technology that we have ever seen as humans, and this will bring tremendous wealth, unprecedented wealth, 16 trillion dollars according to PwC, in terms of added GDP to the worldwide GDP by 2030. It will also bring immense challenges in terms of potential job replacements. Whereas in the industrial age, it created more jobs because craftsman jobs were decomposed into jobs in the assembly line, so more jobs were created. But AI completely replaces the individual jobs in the assembly line with robots, and it's not just in factories. Truckers, drivers, and even、uh, jobs like telesales, customer service, and hematologists, as well as radiologists, over the next 15 years, are going to be gradually replaced by artificial intelligence. Really, the creative jobs are the ones that are protected because AI can optimize but not create. But what's more serious than the loss of jobs is the loss of meaning. Because the work ethic in the industrial age has brainwashed us into thinking that work is the reason we exist, that work defined the meaning of our lives, and I was a prime and willing victim to that type of workaholic thinking. I worked incredibly hard. That's why I almost left my wife in the delivery room. That's why I worked nine nine six alongside of my entrepreneurs, and that obsession. That I had with work ended abruptly a few years ago when I was diagnosed with fourth-stage lymphoma. The PET scan here shows over 20 malignant tumors jumping out like fireballs, melting away my ambition. But more importantly, it helped me re-examine my life, knowing that I may only have a few months to live. Caused me to see how foolish it was. For me to base my entire self-worth on how hard I worked and the accomplishments from hard work, my priorities were completely out of order. I neglected my family. My father had passed away, and I never had the chance to tell him I loved him. My mother had dementia and no longer recognized me, and my children had grown up. During my chemotherapy, I read a book by Bronnie Ware. Who talked about dying wishes and regrets of the people in the deathbed? She found that facing death, nobody regretted that they didn't work hard enough in this life. They only regretted that they didn't spend enough time with their loved ones and that they didn't spread their love. 
So I am fortunately today in remission. So I can be back at TED again to share with you that I have changed my ways. I now only work 9.65, <laughs> occasionally 9.96, but usually 9.65.、Uh, I moved closer to my mother. My tr- wife usually travels with me, and when my kids have vacation, if they don't come home, I go to them. So it's a new form of life that helped me recognize how important it is that love is for me. And facing death helped me change my life, but it also helped me see a new way of how AI should should impact mankind and work and coexist with mankind. That really, what we're AI is taking away a lot of routine jobs, but routine jobs are not what we're about. Where why we exist is love. When we hold our newborn baby, love at first sight. When we help someone in need. Humans are uniquely able to give and receive love, and that's what differentiates us from AI. Despite what science fiction may portray, I can responsibly tell you that AI has no love. When AlphaGo defeated the world champion Kojie, while Kojie was crying and loving the game of Go, AlphaGo felt no happiness from winning, and <laughs> certainly no desire to hug a loved one. So, how do we differentiate ourselves as humans in the age of AI? We talked about the axis of creativity, and certainly that is one possibility. And now we introduce a new axis that we can call compassion, love, or empathy. Those are things that AI cannot do. So, as AI takes away the routine jobs, I like to think we can, we should, and we must create jobs of compassion. You might ask how many of those there are, but I would ask you: Do you not think that we're going to need a lot of social workers to help us make this transition? Do you not think we need a lot of compassionate caregivers to give more medical care to more people? Do you not think we're going to need ten times more teachers to help our children find their way to survive and thrive in this brave new world? And with all the newfound wealth. Should we not also make labors of love into careers, and let elderly accompaniment or homeschooling become careers also? <laughs> This graph is surely not perfect, but it points at four ways that we can work with AI. AI will, AI will come and take away the routine jobs, and in due time, we will be thankful. AI will become great tools for the creatives, so that scientists, artists, musicians, and writers can be even more creative. AI will work with human as analytical tools that humans can wrap their warmth around for the high compassion jobs. And we can always differentiate ourselves with the uniquely capable jobs that are both compassionate and creative, and using and leveraging. Our irreplaceable brains and hearts. So there you have it—a blueprint of coexistence for humans and AI. AI is serendipity. It is here to liberate us from routine jobs, and it is here to remind us what it is that makes us human. So let us choose to embrace AI and to love one another. Thank you. So what is Kaifu telling us? We don't need to see robots in this us versus them way. They're not taking everything away from us. They're doing what they do best to help us do what we do best. And the challenge, or more so the opportunity, is figuring out how we work together. And here's where Kaifu is onto something big, because one of the unique things that humans add is compassion, which brings me to my key point. Why do we need to wait for AI to come to make our workplaces more compassionate? Why can't we integrate compassion, empathy, and the amazing emotions that humans bring to things into our workplaces immediately? So, look, I read this study that really helped me understand how compassion tends to show up or be absent at our workplace. 
It was done by Helen Egan of Birmingham City University. She and her team conducted interviews with people who need to be incredibly compassionate on a daily basis. Nurses. The nurses told her that it was hard for them to be compassionate at work. And get this, it wasn't because compassion was draining for them, but because they couldn't be as compassionate as they wanted to be. They told the researchers they had too many patients, too much paperwork, and too few breaks. One nurse even said that she didn't have time to go to the bathroom for 14 hours. Another said she didn't have time to eat or drink anything the entire workday. They described being so busy that they couldn't give their patients the attention they needed, and they also couldn't give themselves what they needed. I'd call that operating in a compassion deficit on a daily basis. So here's my suggestion of one way to possibly bring compassion back into those nurses' workplaces and into all of our workplaces. How's this for a little self-care? What if we all took a close look at what we do every day and try to notice the routine responsibilities? Which of these can we hand off to technology? Which of these, if automated, could give us the freedom to do more of the work that requires a human touch? I call this an automation audit. And automation audits are key because if we do them properly, they're liberating. But doing them properly is challenging. Figuring out the balance between what needs to be automated and what needs human connection is really tricky. How many times have you been to the doctor only to have them look at the computer screen the entire time? It happened to me a few weeks ago and I was so annoyed. Because on the one hand, I really love that all the technology has allowed any doctor in the system to know my issues. They had all the information at their fingertips, so I didn't have to repeat it. But on the other hand, I felt like the doctor was reading the words in my file that another doctor had written without understanding the emotions behind each word. They were missing everything that was unsaid. And so much goes unsaid in a doctor's appointment that is important for a doctor to pick up on. So as you do your automation audit, make sure the technology is facilitating connection and not taking away from it. Make sure it helps amp up compassion, that human touch, and doesn't reduce it. So that when the AI future Kai Fu Talks About arrives, we and those nurses can successfully hand our most robotic tasks to the robots and we can get back to what we do best. That's it for today. Our producer is Kim Naderfane Peterza. Research for this episode was done by Cassie Braba. Sam Baer is our mixer. Eliza Solomon is our fact checker. And special thanks to Michelle Quint, Corey Hagem, Anna Phelan, and Colin Helms. If you like the podcast, would love it if you'd rate and review it as it helps other people find us. I'm Adupa Akinola, and I'll talk to you again next week.